morning, everybody, and welcome to the town board work session and special meeting for Tuesday, May 7th, 2019. Please rise and join me for the pledge and please remain standing after the pledge for a brief moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I ask that we observe a moment of silence in memory of Dr. Robert Raleigh, who passed away just a few days ago. Dr. Raleigh served as superintendent of the Austin School District for 15 years, between 1992 and 2007. During his years in Austin, Dr. Raleigh was instrumental in laying the groundwork for so many of the excellent programs in our schools that serve Austin's families today, including our science research program and the school district's work to eradicate the achievement gap. He truly left an indelible mark, and through his work, he's touched thousands of lives. He will certainly be missed by his family, friends, and those of us who worked with him during his tenure in the Austin community. Thank you. Roll call. We're going to hold off on the road call, uh, the, oh, the roll call until the special meeting, yeah. Okie dokie. Next up, we're going to, um, actually, we're going to start off with some announcements, and um, I have uh, quite a few of them. I'd like to start by thanking Susie Ross and Green Ossining for an amazing Earth Day festival two weekends ago. Although it was a bit chilly and windy, there were still a lot of people that came to check out the great vendors and musical performances. A big thank you to the Town Parks Department for all of their hard work to help make sure everything ran smoothly. And yes, the incredible Earth Day sign that greeted everyone at the festival was made by hand by our very talented park staff. So thank you for that. The town had a few special guests at Earth Day, including our friend Modu Cham from 511 New York Rideshare, and his colleague Heliana Higby even stopped by with her few-week-old baby. 511 New York Rideshare had a booth right next to Austin's at the Earth Day Festival, and Councilwoman Shaw and I were pleased to be presented by Modu with a certificate recognizing the town for becoming a Clean Air New York partner. This board voted to adopt a community partnership with Clean Air New York in order to help residents thoughtfully consider the impacts of their commuting choices, as well as connect residents with air quality action day updates and suggestions. So we are happy to receive this award. Uh, Zeke Morrell from Sam Schwartz Engineering was also at our Town Village booth presenting some concepts for bike lanes along North State Road. Zeke got some great feedback from the community, which he and his colleagues are now going to consider as they work on refining the scope of this project to reflect the input that we have received. We hope to invite Zeke and Mike Flynn back in a few months for another presentation to the community for additional feedback. Zeke also shared short and long-term concepts for improvement to the intersection at North State Road and Route 100 to allow cyclists and pedestrians to more safely cross from the town's business district and parts of Millwood to the North County Trailway in Millwood. New York State Department of Transportation is currently planning improvements to the North County Trailway in this area as part of the Governor's Empire State Trail Initiative, and we're hopeful that they will consider implementing some of Sam Schwartz's design recommendations to add a crosswalk and traffic signal at this intersection. We got lots of positive feedback on that, and we submitted our uh, recommendations to the DOT as part of their uh, public feedback um, response. This past week, we submitted comments to the Department of Transportation. I, I forgot that I was planning to say that, including the feedback that we received at Earth Day, um, and it, we encouraged them to consider making this intersection safer for, for cyclists, pedestrians, and simultaneously for drivers. This project is all part of our Millwood Austin Go or MOGO initiative in partnership with the Village of Austin and the Town of Newcastle, as well as Westchester County Department of Planning. We heard last week that our MOGO plan is going to be recognized with a planning commendation by the Westchester County Municipal Planning Federation at their awards dinner later this month. So thank you so much to our many community partners that have worked on this effort to make Austin and Newcastle more bike and pedestrian friendly we're so pleased to be receiving this prestigious recognition. 
I also want to thank those community members who participated in I Love My Parks Day at the Old Crone Aqueduct and the two Riverkeeper Sweeps in Osney this past weekend. Uh, teams assembled at the Sing Sing Kill on Saturday near Dell Cemetery and at Lewis Angle Park and Henry Gordine Park on our waterfront, as well as on Quaker Ridge Road at the Old Croton Aqueduct to pick up trash and prevent it from damaging our waterways. And they also removed invasives, fixed up walls, and added native plantings. As always, the events were well attended and a great success. Extra special thanks to Gareth Huffman from Hudson Valley Arts and Science, who organized the River Sweep, Riverkeeper River Sweep at uh, the Sing Sing Kill, and to Susie Ross from Green Ossining, who organized the riverfront, the waterfront cleanup, as well as to Diane Alden from Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct for putting together uh, the one at the aqueduct, obviously. Um, and these are really, really important community events. So thanks everyone for helping us show pride in our beautiful town. Since our last town board meeting, we also received some bittersweet news. The village of Ossining has tapped our own town board member Karen DeTore to be their new village manager. Uh, we have um, really enjoyed working with Karen so much and I particularly have worked with her since I was uh, became town supervisor in 2016 and then for many years before that on a variety of community projects and initiatives. I think probably that all started with um, I'm guessing PTA as uh, so many did and uh, Lots of camping trips, uh, among other things. Um, taekwondo, who knows? A whole host of other things. So um, that that's um, it's been a fantastic uh, time working together, and we know that you're not going too far because you're going to be right downstairs from us, and we anticipate working together uh, even better for our community as we move forward. Um, we anticipate uh, receiving your letter of resignation at our next board meeting and at that time since this is our first meeting since we have um, had this news to discuss um, we will announce what our plans are for uh, appointing somebody to the unexpired term uh, that Karen will leave open when she leaves our town board. Um, so there are quite a few events to keep you busy so anyway congratulations Karen. We're excited for you and I'm gonna for miss all you. of us. We're going to miss you, but we're very Thank excited. Thank you. There are quite a few events to keep you busy this Thursday evening, May 9th. From 5 to 7, with a rain date of Saturday, May 11th, from 2 to 4, the Briarcliff Chamber of Commerce is hosting their first annual Sip and Shop with many local businesses along Pleasantville Road and North State Road offering special promotions and other treats for shoppers. Here's just a taste of what you can expect. Babysitting at Club Fit. Drinks and special promotions at March. Wondrous Things in Holbrook Cottage also have those sorts of things and so much more. The Austin Documentary and Discussion Series will be starting at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday with a screening of Plastic Paradise, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Plastic Paradise highlights the scary reality of where so much of our plastic goes, since nearly every piece of plastic that has ever been created since the 19th century is still somewhere on our planet. It just doesn't break down. It doesn't go away. I think most of it is actually in our oceans. Jordan Christensen, Program Coordinator for the Citizens Campaign for the Environment, and Deborah Magadini, researcher at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, will participate in the post-screening uh, Q&A. This film is sure to be an eye-opening experience about the severe consequences of our plastic consumption. Just as an aside, we announced a new Take a Bag, Leave a Bag initiative at Earth Day, um, which we implemented with the help of Green Ossining at Four Seasons Sea Town on Croton Avenue. So please look for the friendly oversized bag with a kangaroo on it if you forgot to bring your own reusable bag or if you have lots of extras to unload. This will hopefully help prepare the public for the plastic bag ban, which the state voted into law at the end of April and which goes into effect in 2020. Also on Thursday night, Assemblywoman Sandy Galef will be holding a community forum from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Croton Free Library to discuss the power of public financing, amplifying the voice of the everyday voter. Assemblywoman Galef will be joined by several panelists, Quentin Phipps, member of the Connecticut House of Representatives, Joanna Zdenis, counsel for the Brennan Center's Democracy Program, and Joan Mandel, executive director of Democracy Matters. For more information about this event, contact Assemblywoman Galef's district office at 914-941-1111. 
This Saturday, May 11th, Green Austin will hold a repair cafe. They have been very busy. Between Earth Day Festival two weekends ago, River Sweep this past weekend, and tag their sale. tag sale last weekend, um, and they have the Repair Cafe. I, I think they're going to be pretty beat after, at the end of this. So anyway, the Repair Cafe is from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Community Center, and the Repair Cafe helps you fix your broken but beloved items for free, keeping these items out of the trash. The Repair Cafe can help you with anything from sewing up a torn seam fixing an appliance, or even tech support for your computer or mobile device. But no gas-powered items, please. That evening, be sure to check out a special Saturday performance of Jazz at the Lodge with one of my favorite local vocalists performing. It's the Ann Carpenter Quartet at the Elks Lodge at 118 Croton Avenue at 7.30 p.m. Message John Codman III on Facebook to reserve your table. Summer camp registration is open. Visit villageofostening.org to access the recreation catalog to register your child for summer camp. This year, pre-K through first grade will be at Brookside. School, second through fifth graders are either at Ryer Park, there's a waiting list for this option, or Claremont School, and sixth through ninth graders will be at Veterans Park. In addition to summer camp, Austin Recreation is offering so many great programs for kids to stay busy over the summer. So I encourage you to check out all those offerings, especially the ones at Cedar Lane Arts Center. Your child cannot register for camp if they have not received their vaccinations. The Westchester Department of Health is offering free measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine on Tuesday, May 14th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. on both days. All are welcome, but children attending summer camp Camp counselors and staff are strongly encouraged to get vaccinated by the Department of Health. To schedule an appointment, call the county at 914-995-5800 or visit www.health.ny.gov slash go to clinic slash six zero. We're looking for groups and individuals interested in taking on a small project as part of Stash the Trash. Austin's annual effort to help clean up and beautify the community. Projects will be supported by the Village of Austin Parks Department and include cleaning up litter, flower planting, raking, and more. Organize a group to take part in this community event on Saturday, May 18th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Contact the Village Parks and Recreation at 941-3189 for more information. And finally, the Austin Boat and Canoe Club will hold their annual commissioning day and veterans memorial ceremony on Sunday, May 19th at 11 a.m. Head down to the waterfront and enjoy this important annual event. You will be in good company. Councilwoman Liz Feldman will be sure to be there. And with that, unless there are any announcements by my colleagues. Um, I'm just noticing that tomorrow from 5 to 8.30 is dinner at the Moose. Oh. And they do make a very good dinner. Okay. Um, so it's 37 Croton Avenue, Austin, New York. And... From 5 to 8.30, they usually have a soup, a couple of entrees, uh, salad, and bread. I believe you enter behind the building, so the backside, um, kind of where the theater enters, so the library, that, that backside of that building is where you would enter for this dinner. Fantastic. Any other announcements? All right. Well, hearing none, our uh, guest this evening uh, for our work, first work session uh, agenda item is um, Gail Pisha and George Klein from the Sierra Club. And um, Austin's been at the forefront of renewable energy throughout Westchester County for many years. We were one of the first communities to join the Northern Westchester Energy Action Consortium, which is now Energize New York. We participated in the Energize program. We've incentivized solar panels at local homes and businesses. Um, we've introduced electric charging stations to town parks and alternative fuel vehicles to our town fleet. We've introduced community choice aggregation, which is a little bit of what's going to be highlighted here. And uh, we switched the community through that to 100% renewable energy as the default option for homes for their electricity supply, uh, while lowering cost to our community members. So George and Gail are here from our local chapter of the Sierra Club to discuss how Austin is helping to build a sustainable path forward in the shadow of climate change and how we have many lessons to teach others in our region. And I'm hoping that from our announcements you hear that those weren't just for you, but we really do have a lot of different um, environmentally sustainable 
uh, initiatives that are taking place here that we are supportive of. So thanks so much for coming this evening. And I think I'm going to slide over you guys if you want to so we can listen and watch at the same time. And, thank, and congratulations to you for all your new recognition, because that's sort of what this is about. It's about how Austin is being recognized across New York State for all the good work you're doing. So um, I, my name is Gail Pisha. I live in Rockland County in the town of Clarkstown, and Clarkstown is one of the towns featured in here as well. And George Klein lives in Austin. He can introduce himself. I'm, I'm very proud to be an Ossiningite, and I'm even prouder tonight because of the, of the leading actions that Ossining has, has taken, is taking, and will take. It's, it's very bracing. I'm very proud. Um, so let's see. Uh, I, left, I left click? OK. What is the Sierra Club? It's America's oldest. Um, and largest, and we think the most influential grassroots environmental organization in, in, in the uh, United States, uh, was founded in 1892 by John Muir, and it, it grew particularly in the, in the 60s. Uh, there are 3.5 million members and supporters. We have 64 state chapters, and in New York State, we have 11 local groups. We're, we here are known as the Lower Hudson Group, and we're comprised of Westchester, Rockland, and Putnam counties, and we have about 5,500 members, and I believe we have a few hundred in, in Ossining. Um, it's increasingly clear that humans are reshaping our environment in ways that are extremely dangerous. Although the Sierra Club works to protect our air and our water and our wild places, we are increasingly working to keep climate change from getting worse. So it's, it's, it's really the, the, the single biggest issue in the Sierra Club at this point. So the question is, what can we do to get climate change under control? The major cause of climate change is greenhouse gas emissions, most of which come from burning fossil fuels for electricity, heating our buildings, and transportation. So in New York State and in other states, Sierra Club is working to get communities to lower their greenhouse gas emissions by transitioning to 100% uh, renewable energy. And last year in New York State, we identified and wrote up the stories of a dozen communities in, um, across the state which stood out for the innovative ways that they've moved toward 100% renewable energy. And so Asani is one of those. Um, the stories are contained in this booklet called New York Municipalities Moving Toward Clean Renewable Energy. And it's, it's about 32 pages. And I'm still waiting to receive the hard copies from the printer. So, um, but we will be getting you a couple of hard copies once we get them. But we do, we did take out the Austin story to give to everyone tonight. Um, so we also have digital copies on our website, our chapter website, uh, so that other municipal leaders and um, activists can go to the website and read the stories and download them if they want it. And the real purpose of putting this all together was so that we have 54,000 members across New York State. And so the, now our members, our volunteers, can go to their municipal um, leaders and you know their town boards and all, and they can ask them to make the switch to uh, renewable energy. And, and they can say, look, this is how these 12 communities have done that, um, while saving money for their residents. <laughs> so. Um, our website, it, I had the, the regular URL on the first page, but actually if you go to newyork.sierraclub.org, so it's pretty easy, newyork.sierraclub.org, um, and on the home page, there'll be a link to the municipal toolkit, and when you click on that, you get to this page. Um, and this page is divided into four parts. So part one is the list of resources available in New York State. And this is what you'll get if you uh, click on that link and you can download it. Um, you're probably familiar with um, Climate Smart and Clean Energy Communities, but, but this has a number of, 
of things available in New York State, and many of them do carry some opportunities for funding. Um, and because you're a clean energy community, you know that. But there's geothermal uh, heat pump rebates and things like that, too. Uh, part two is the municipal toolkit I showed you the, the cover page of with the 12 stories. And just there, it's there in three formats. So there's like a one and a half megabyte format. So you can just email that. But there's the high resolution ones, or, you know, if anybody ever wants that for whatever you need it for. Then in part three, we took each community's individual story separately. And so it's each one is in a high resolution version, but still small enough to email. And you'll see two things on for each community. One is the condensed story from the booklet, which we're going to be giving you tonight. Um, and then there's also a, the full original story, which was the text that each of the municipal leaders um, approved and edited. Uh, but we had to, we couldn't fit everything. It would have been well over 50 pages when we tried to put everything in. So um, if you, if you're interested in reading more about a particular community or one of the programs, you could download or read um, online the, the full original story. And part four is the pledge to support the transition to 100% renewable energy. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I'm going to briefly just present uh, some of the story, well, all the stories, the, the municipalities and the programs that were featured in the booklet. Um, and these case studies show how communities can improve their health, create jobs, and protect the environment all the while saving money for their residents. And that was really the key takeaway across all these stories that uh, municipal leaders were able to protect their, protect the environment, but yet saving money. And as you've seen, in Austin. Um, these stories are from municipalities all across the state. And um, I mean, it doesn't include New York City or Albany or Buffalo because they're sort of a different, they work, it works differently, so it doesn't translate as well. So um, we started off with East Hampton because they've actually made a full binding commitment to 100% renewable electricity by 2020 and across all sectors by 2030. And they're doing that through efficiency, wind, offshore wind for them, and solar. Um, and the rest of the communities in the booklet have taken some initiatives. Um, to, but to save time, I'm only going to say one thing for each community because um, we could, it would take a long time. So some towns are adopting electric vehicles and charging infrastructure like Amherst, which is in Western New York. Um, communities are using solar in a number of different ways. So some towns are getting their electricity from municipal solar installations like DeWitt. Clarkstown, where I live, um, is getting their municipal electricity from the first solar installation on a capped landfill in New York State. And that presented some really interesting challenges to them to get the permits because it hadn't been done here. Avon Central School District uh, put solar on their public schools. Oops. Whoops. OK. Um, Delaware residents benefit from payments in lieu of taxes, which are called pilot payments, um, and a 10% electricity discount from community solar projects. And I love the picture with the sheep eating under them. <laughs> um, the town of Grand Island will be meeting 100% of their electricity needs through community solar projects as soon as they're, they're building two right now. And when those are done, they'll, they'll be uh, an electricity Electricity, a zero electricity um, uh, town. Uh, Red Hook residents helped get solar panels on their homes through a solarized program. Uh, the city of Schenectady is converting their street lights to energy efficient LEDs. Lockport Housing Authority is saving about $50,000 a year on electricity costs after they uh, converted one of their housing projects to geothermal energy. And the town of Eagle reduced their town taxes to zero. That's like zero town taxes. 
um, from pilot payments from land-based wind farms. And they actually also, some of those pilot payments also went to school, two of the school districts that they straddle. And also they got things like um, uh, garbage collection, which in rural areas, you, you know, people don't usually have garbage collection and they got some town snow plows and things all from this uh, wind. But the nicest thing about it was the farmers that live there were able to lease portions of their land and that helped them, I mean, they could farm up to the base of the wind turbines, but then it helped them keep their uh, land and still farm on it and made that possible. So now Ossining isn't the last one in the book. I think you're third, but I, I put you last here because we wanted to say a little bit more about it. Um, and in the booklet, we highlighted Ossining's early adoption of community choice aggregation. Um, and I wanted to point out that Supervisor Levenberg not only credits the partnership of the town board um, and the environmental advisory committee, but she also gave a shout out to Green Ossining for helping get CCA accepted by educating their neighbors. And I, I thought maybe we, we mentioned it to Susie Ross a while back. We thought maybe someone would be here. And I just wanted you to know that Ossining's example on CCA is bearing fruit in Rockland because the villages of Upper Nyack and Nyack are now, they're, they're to the point where they're going to be voting on the enabling legislation for CCA. And South Nyack and Piermont are very close behind. They're looking at it. And then we have people that will be bringing them to um, the village of Pomona. Well, I'm not sure it's a village, but I think it's I'm not sure if it's a village in, in the town of Ramapo and actually to the town of Clarkstown. So it's really spreading. <laughs> so. um, and we only had enough room in the booklet to feature Austin's work on community choice aggregation. But um, if you go to the web page and click on Austin's full story, you'll see the whole story, including these, you know, this list of great environmental steps that the town is taking that you are taking to live sustainably. Uh, do, I, do I click to go on? While the most important part of Sierra Club's work is to get communities to switch to renewable energy, we are also asking them to support the transition to 100% clean renewable energy by signing this aspirational pledge, which is non-binding. And we've brought, the, we, we've brought the pledge with us. We hope to use these pledges to show the governor and state legislators that community leaders like you across the state are already taking the climate change threat seriously and the state needs to move more quickly to renewables. We hope you'll consider executing, signing this, this pledge of support. Hmm? Thank you for being a part of this toolkit to inspire other municipalities across the state. And most of all, thank you for your willingness to move Ossining toward a more sustainable future. I really am very proud to be an Ossiningite uh, tonight because of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you think I actually have had an opportunity to circulate this pledge? Um, but you know, you can circulate it, you can recirculate it, I, I think a while back actually. And um, I know that, you know, I think that subsequent to that, you know, you kind of clarified for us, uh, Gail, that, you know, that it's non-binding and it's aspirational and it's basically just saying that this is a direction that we all want to go, but um, without actually locking us into a date when we're gonna be right. there. So right. I think that's the thing that's, you know, hardest for us. Uh, thank you very much. To uh, um, I don't know which one. So th th this is we're asking you to take a political act, but it's not a controversial political act. But it is it is a political act. It's it's to push the people upstairs to act more quickly. Right. I'm sorry. You guys just have to go up to the microphone. Just stand by the microphone. Um, Sierra Club has a Ready for 100 program in the National Club where communities actually do take uh, what it, I've heard is called a binding pledge to do something by a certain time like East Hampton did. But this is just an aspirational pledge that is, it doesn't have any deadlines. And it's just because I'm hearing that at the state 
what we're hearing at the state level that some of the legislators are a little nervous about supporting climate legislation because they're afraid they're going to get pushback. So it's more for that kind of um, statement. Okay. But you well, can I'm, I'll take our direction a little bit from council, but um, I mean, I certainly would feel feel good about uh, signing an aspirational pledge in that direction. Uh, I think actually what's been very interesting um, is that um, because of the uh, moratorium that Con Ed imposed on Westchester County, for the most of Westchester County to not uh, add any additional uh, gas lines after, I think it was May 15th, maybe it was a deadline? It was yeah. March 15th? March? I think it was March. March. Um, that, um, I, I was I went to the sustainable sustainability conference um, like a week or two ago I guess um, in Westchester and everybody was out with their alternatives to gas and you know you're starting to see geothermal and heat pumps and all of these other possibilities and you know starting to see more wind more solar and you know I think what's really interesting is that um, we can see, like, with C the thing about CCA that I thought was um, really great was by bringing so through Sustainable Westchester um, and through the consortium that was then became Westchester Power, um, we are able with collective our collective efforts to push demand for green energy alternatives and supply, you know, green energy supply uh, by saying, you know, this is what we, and, and having companies be able to, pr to produce green energy to, to the grid, um, that then makes it, uh, you know, makes it possible for us to, to start weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels. Uh, so I think that that, you know, and the, the fact that we were able to do that and save money for our residents who, uh, you know, were, are utilizing electricity supply has been really, um, I think, transformative. So um, I, I'm, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of this board for voting to uh, for the green option. And I'm, I'm very grateful to Sierra Club and um, Council Adana. Did you want to um, say anything? You move that microphone a little closer to you. And, you know. Excuse me? No, I said you just move the microphone like you want to say something oh, about no, this um, pledge. I mean, I don't see, you know, obviously, it's writ it seems like it's written in the voice of just the supervisor. Um, That's who's so. usually been signing it. Well, right. it came from the mayor's pledge from a number of years ago, so it was written, for, but we tried to broaden it out to town supervisors. and mm -hmm. Right, like to, right. to whoever the head of the right. municipality is as opposed to even being of the board. I mean, obviously, it, it would be beneficial, and it would seem that, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, that the board would probably be in support of this as well, but... I mean, I don't see any language in here that's problematic, um, but it, it would, or, I mean, most of it is things that you guys are already doing just of your own volition because these are things that you believe in. So um, I don't see any problem with it from a Well, I mean, you can take your time and decide sure. because actually it has a, the one I gave you, you might have the older one, which had the different um, contact information. That was the only difference. So the, if it says RF 100 or something, it says ready for 100. Ready for 100. Yep. So when you decide, um, mm -hmm. then you can just do, they ask you to submit it to them. I mean, you could let us know if you, that would be nice, but, but you decide, you sure. can think about it. And I think, I know that the supervisor could sign this, but I think you felt more comfortable knowing that the board knowing was supportive. wanting yes. the board support. So, right. so whatever we appreciate it. And okay, and fantastic. the only thing that would probably require a little bit of conversation is that um, in the the actual pledge part, it says, "I hereby pledge to work with my community to realize a vision of 100% renewable energy in blank." And I assume that's a year. Or uh, is that the state? I, is no, that in the, the city? name of that's the municipality. The municipality. Okay. okay, so like it's. Austin. It's not like you're. It's right. not like a year where right. you're saying, okay, we we're striving to get there by then. Okay. Right. The original. Say it does say by 2030. To work toward a vision of 100%. Yeah. Well, it says toward, New York has already committed to 20 percent right. by 2030. 2030. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's in the clean energy standards through New York. The original aspirational pledge did have like a a by such and such a right. date. But but then it wasn't really meant to scare people, and and so uh, you weren't the only person that felt it was a little, too, it was too, you know, it was looking more, as uh, not as aspirational and more binding. So, right. So that's why we changed it, because the purpose was just to get 
some kind of support. So, okay. So thank you. Oh, great. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. We very much appreciate the recognition by Sierra Club. I mean, we're certainly not the only municipality that's participated in CCA, which we're really happy about. And our partners in the village of Austin have also, which has been great. Right. Um, and uh, I'm just very proud to look at the list of uh, different um, initiatives that the other community, these other 12 communities have taken and know that we have done many, many, many of them here in Austin. I know that you had that list. Um, I actually have, I was going to mention this uh, latest and greatest thing that came to the Westchester Municipal Officials Organization. We had a presentation by um, Simple Recycling the other day, and it's a way for people to just easily recycle their soft goods um, curbside. And at no cost, people just put their stuff in these pink bags and this um, company comes and picks the stuff up and then it gets recycled. And it was just very interesting. Um, they put little uh, like iPad-like devices in the garbage trucks and, or, and on recycling days, people put their stuff out and when the, the um, refuse trucks go around to the reset you know to pick up the recycling and they see a pink bag they just hit the button and then the little van the simple recycling vans kind of know where to go and they have the routes and they coordinate with the um refuse collection trucks to make sure that they can go so you can just put your i know you define soft Ifka. recycling any clothing i think you can do shoes you could do one shoe if you if you lost your the other shoe if you lost a sock you can do if that doesn't want that stuff, they don't want the one shoe. They don't want the one sock. I think they take broken belts. They take all sorts of stuff. Some of the stuff is actually, you know, repurposed, but some of it is actually, um, I mean, some of it goes to places like IFCA that would do, that would um, resell it. The community also gets a small um, uh, percentage, I guess, or, uh, you know, a little piece of so some kind of uh, money from the collection effort in these communities. And um, I, you know, was just going to ask the board. I sent you out the presentation that um, they sent to Westchester Municipal officials because I just got it this morning. So if it's something that we want, I think they would come and present to us too. This is just yet another initiative that we can uh, adopt to put more of our stuff, keep more of our stuff out of the landfills and put it back um, into into good use. One one just comment. Um, the reason we approached you was because we had met with Sustainable Westchester and we said we, we wanted to uh, interview a, a community leader that did CCA because that's what Westchester was so, you know, unique about. And, and they said, oh, you've got to go to us because they're doing so many wonderful things. So it's because, you, you know, that was the advice. Um, and it's certainly true. So. Well, we have a great board, and I think that the board sees sees yeah. the, what our future is and any steps that we can take yeah. um, in the direction of countering climate change, I think that we've been willing to do so to date. So thank you again for the thank presentation. You. And it also, the other thing we always make, like I just testified yesterday on the NOx hearings um, to reduce nitrous oxide and it's just also when we do something to make climate change not so bad we're going to save people's health partly and also because the um storms we're having if we if they get much worse i mean that's billions of dollars in damage so Absolutely. yeah, yeah and another one of our focuses i think has been like to look at um you know planning for healthy communities and we know that um making you know fossil fuel sort of getting rid of a uh, fossil fuel as an option for uh, energy production is ultimately going to be better for our, our health as well. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, I don't know if just the board wants to just take yeah, a quick little poll of the board. Or does anybody have any questions for Gail or for George? I just wanted, I just wanted to tell you that uh, I've been a a paying member of Sierra Club for the past 15 years. Oh, thank you. Wonderful. Because I have the backpacks and I got all, all the things <laughs> that go with it. Because I, I use my backpack when I go fishing. Right. Wow. Actually, you know, I've, I've been on conversations with Sierra Club members all over the country. And most people, or like 65% of people that got involved with Sierra Club was through the hike program because we have even international hikes. That's how people, a lot of people got involved. When Mike 
kids were young, we used to, there were family hikes, and I used to take them. So, That's but nice. thank you. Um, we appreciate all the good work that you're doing and to highlight all you. these efforts. Really and wonderful. we tabled at Green Austin's um, fair too. Like we work with them in. We try to partner with. The Earth Day. <laughs> I feel like I didn't see so many people, and I was there all the day long. I don't know what happened. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, I, I just thought I mean, we could just take a, a quick poll of the board to see if you're generally in favor of the pledge, um, so we could send uh, Gail and George away with uh, some kind of a positive message. And it's certainly where we're heading, so we're kind of on our way. So I would absolutely be in support of it. Yes. 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 yes um, okay. Being a card-carrying member of Sierra Club, of course, you, said you have to say yes to that. Councilman Feldman, okay. So uh, we have a, a unanimous consensus that um, we can move forward with signing this pledge. So I think we can add it to uh, a resolution to our next regular meeting um, that we will be signing this pledge. Okay. So, and we will send it. We'll send it back to you after we do. Okay. Authorizing me to sign it. Wonderful. Thanks again so much. And next up, we have a departmental report from our wonderful receiver of taxes. Yes, that's right. Those two words, those words all go together. Holly Perlitz. Um, this is our quarterly check-in with our receiver. And um, Holly's fresh off the town county tax collection is here tonight to catch us up on how it all went. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Uh, as Dana said, I'm here to talk about the 2019 town and county tax collection which substantially happened in april although we got payments in march as soon as the bills went out with our electronic system now people got notified and they started paying us right away isn't that wonderful um, if i had to describe it i would say it went enormously smooth and i was very delighted about that i bet that's probably one of the best things you can say about collecting taxes is it just went smoothly um, as you probably know, our warrant was $32,215,598. And as of close of business today, we collected 97% of that, which is pretty amazing. Um, the remaining balance is about $930,000, and that relates to 344 properties, which um, is very good. Um, and um, I anticipate delinquent letters going out, not next week, but the week afterwards, and that usually brings in a good portion of those as well. Um, approximately 6,000 bills were sent out, um, and approximately 4,100 were paid by our mortgage, uh, by mortgage companies and banks. Um, so I, I, I say that only because I wanted to raise the fact that we did change printers and fulfillment companies this year, uh, or for this tax collection. And again, the fact that I can say it went smoothly, I'm very delighted. <laughs> um, you know, I, I thought that uh, one of the problems that I had seen was just a uh, perhaps a lack of communication between uh, the fulfillment company and the local postmaster. And while I know the post office has these rules about, uh, you know, or a, a procedure that when mail goes out, it first goes to White Plains before it goes back to, to, to Austin and a whole bunch of rules and procedures that I don't really understand. But I just thought it was a good idea for the carriers to take a look at what our envelope looks like and know it's important. And getting to talk to them about that extra step about when you see this, it's really important. So try to get it to the person. Um, and I, I have to say, I can't quantify it, but I would say that just eyeballing the number of envelopes that we got back for things like couldn't find a receptacle or that seem to have diminished. Um, and I just felt like the carriers took more care in getting, um, in getting the tax bills to our taxpayers. Um, we also use something called first class pre-sort, so I'm getting a little education in that. And as a result of that, we paid 42.88 cents per envelope versus 55 cents. As you know, the postage went up, uh, as well. And, um, that seemed to have worked out well. Our mail slot is in, you know, is, is, is working. Again, I can't really tell how many people are using it, but I know it was a wonderful response to people when they say, oh, I can't get to you. 
even though we had late hours the last two days of collections, even though we collect online. Some people are just more comfortable mailing. And um, as a result of that, it was a great solution to offer to our taxpayers. Um, over 1,000 people used our online uh, system, Express Pay. And just in the last two days, we've upgraded it to their next generation. And as a result of that, I'm hoping even more people will use it for the following reasons. Now you'll be able to pay on your phone. Yes, people want to pay by their phone all the time. Nobody wants to go to a computer anymore. So now the way this works, and I'm no expert, but it, it, the, the payments are, or the screens conform to a, a telephone, uh, to a phone, a cell phone, and you can actually pay online. Uh, you can also create your own account with this new generation, which allows you to store your information. Some people do want to be able to do that uh, so that you don't have to re-enter everything when you go back to pay the next time. And also to schedule payments. So in other words, if you get the, um, the e-blast from me saying, bills are out, go get them on the online system, you can actually schedule it and then have it not release until the end of the month, you know, which a lot of people would like to do as well. They give the tax receiver a bit of a heart attack, you know, because all the payments come in, or many of the payments come in the last couple of days. Um, so I'm hoping that those features will just make it um, even more attractive to, to use. Um, Again, I think the eye contacts we have now gotten up to, um, or e-blasts have now, we're over about 21, almost 2,200 people getting them, which is really terrific. Um, and um, I haven't gotten any complaints about you know it being annoying, but the last, you know, once a week, um, I, I send something out. I'm very thankful. Dana announces it on her um, weekly supervisors update. We had it on Channel 12 News. Uh, any place we could put it, we did. Uh, not to mention all the organizations that I'm involved in. Every time I went, I'd say, did you pay your taxes? So, you know, I think that's a lot of it. I think people are just busy, and they get the bill, and they just have tasks and they forget. Um, and we do have people who are, you know, the community is, the demographics is such that people are coming to the ends of their 30-year mortgages, and that's always a, a, a challenge. And I'm trying to do the best I can in educating taxpayers about that as well. So again, smooth. It went very smooth, and I'm very delighted uh, to, to do that, to, to be able to report that. And um, any questions? Like you say, said, you mentioned to me that we saved a little bit of money. With it. We did. We, we, we did. The way they bill is different than the, uh, the former fulfillment. We certainly sp saved uh, over $800 just in postage alone uh, because of using a reduced rate by this pre-sort. It has to go out first class, but we use something called pre-sort, which I has the fulfillment company uh, sort everything by zip, zip code, apparently. I'm not apparently. I am not an expert on this, but this was the explanation that they sort things by zip code, which you'd think were all 10562, but you'd be amazed at how many out-of-state people we have. Yeah, or 10510, right? Um, we, ha we have a lot of out-of-state people paying, paying taxes, um, so the, the pre-sorting saved us. Plus, they charge us by um, per mail piece. Uh, so um, yes, uh, it was definitely, in terms of dollars, it was definitely cheaper as well and uh, reliable. And I, I'm very pleased with, pleased with how that went. So smooth, a smooth transition. And they do a lot electronically, which is a lot of communication back and forth um, electronically, which was uh, great. Nobody wants to talk on the phone anymore. So. <laughs> Okay. We only had, I, I had uh, two uh, letters delivered to my house for mm -hmm. somebody else. Oh. For the tax bill. And I took them to the <laughs> house. So I said, there's no use giving it back to the oh. <laughs> Did the post office pay you for that? Yeah. <laughs> the one person told me I could have kept it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. The other one was glad 
glad to get it. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we can't, you know, the law is structured such that we really can't be responsible for how the mail works. We can't. Um, but I, I really do feel that, um, again, the, the mail carriers were very conscious of it. It's just, sometimes it's just a matter of caring. So perhaps they got it to the wrong house, but they got it to a house. So, and, and fortunately, by tremendous luck, they got it to the house of somebody who's a solid citizen and who, 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 deli who exactly. further delivered it. So that's even more important. That'd be good if all, all the missed deliveries <coughs> could go to, to Mr. Wilcher. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not enough to do there. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> nice well, you can put it right, you can put it right in the backpack and off Anyway, is there any any questions? Any? I'm sure I'll be back later on over the summer to talk about the lean process and all that. But we'll okay. Well, we're grateful okay. for the update and for the um, positive uh, response that you've been getting, and uh, appreciate. I'm sure the community appreciates all of your uh, proactive emails as well. So thank you for that. Have a good night. Because <laughs> it's over. <laughs> do I, do, did you say I don't see? You do not see yeah, it. Stressed out. Yeah. But that's it's my demeanor. Day, <laughs> day the last day of collection, she looks a little different. <laughs> okay, today she's good. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Is it okay if I bring that tree up? Because it's wreaking havoc. Absolutely. All right, screen be gone. Okay, am I still, are we still rolling? Still okay, rolling. we're still rolling, okay. So um, next up, we wanted to talk about um, a request that re we received uh, <coughs> from a community member who shared that his father uh, had been working in downtown Manhattan on 9-11 and had recently succumbed to an illness that um, and passed away as a result of his exposure on that day. Um, the community member had asked the town to consider the installation of a, mor a memorial or some kind of addition to a memorial that already exists at the waterfront to recognize members of the community who perished as a result of a 9-11 related illness or injury and I wanted to um, toss around some ideas with the board to see um, if we could come up with a potential solution and maybe just to highlight what some of the issues might be. And um, if we decide to move forward, um, who exactly we would be list we would be offering a chance to be listed or included as part of this memorial, um, since we are most likely going to be getting a, an unfortunately longer list than, um, you know, than we might anticipate. We don't really know who's out there, but if we were to make this um, memorial available to our uh, community residents, I'm, I'm assuming that we would get more people who would say, yes, I'd like to be included, or they have a, a loved one who they'd like to have included. So I know a couple of us, when we were down at the waterfront, took a look at the current memorials that are down there right now, there are two. Um, that are there that um, a village and a town memorial uh, village one is or just substantially larger rock with a plaque on one side of it um, but it has another large face and that is the village uh, memorial then the town has a smaller stone a little bit that's a little bit far, set back farther from the river um, one of the conversations that we've been having ongoing I know that the parks were interested in consolidating as was um, a member of the Chamber of Commerce had suggested that we consolidate um, and have one memorial all together in one spot. Uh, a couple of the other ideas that had, had come up um, was either put a plaque up where you could just continue to add names um, as, they, as they arise. Right now there are no names that we found. I don't know, we don't know if something fell off of a memorial down there or not, but right now there are no names on the plaques. It just mentions the town and the village um, and in the um, descriptions on the, um, on the rocks and, uh, and the event, obviously. Um, but the, uh, there is, you know, again, there's that one large stone, so we could 
potentially put a, a plaque on the one side, a you know, metal plaque, which then we would have somebody come down to add names to. Um, or we could put up something like the flag holders down there. That was another suggestion that somebody had come up with. Um, so as we add people, those like sort of look like lollipops, kind of where the, you know, the veterans um, have the flag holders. <coughs> Um, we could look into something like that that would be more flexible. I think, um, you know, unfortunately, those pieces would be um, able to walk away easily, easily more able to walk away. I think that the better option would actually be to. Um, so we don't usually have community input at our work sessions, um, but since we only have one person in the <laughs> audience and she's raising her hand high, um, maybe we can make an exception. Jane Ozer, uh, did you want to come on up? But you have to. You have to go to the microphone. <laughs> really, I, we just don't do this usually, but sometimes we I do. was just wondering if maybe people could, because we could use some more trees down there, if they could buy a tree and then we, the town provides a plaque. I don't know if that's an option. So, right, plaque. so that's another suggestion, adopt a tree. I mean, we, we, uh, we, ha we actually recently did plant a tree down there. Um, well, well, we plant, wait. We, we planted one um, yeah. for Arbor Day, and then um, that one actual Arbor Day, and then we had another one planted on the Monday following Arbor Day. Um, that was a little bit set back. I think we talked about this already, but I'm not sure. We planted, replanted uh, a shad. Well, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not a sh the shad bush is the one that we planted behind the nearer to the memorial, but we planted a black willow or swamp willow in the place of the what was known as the prom tree, which is sort of right in the rocks. Um, it had died. Apparently they only have about a 65 year uh, lifespan and it had died, we believe of natural causes and it, it was, it had been cut down. Um, and we replanted uh, in some seedlings, what are they called? Treelings, yes, saplings, saplings, yes. saplings in the actual, um, stump of the remain, remainder of the tree, which is now sort of turned into a nice lush compost. It made a one, wonderful planter. And it made a great planter. So um, I think a number of us, of us were down there in Arbor Day. Um, but anyway, it is a nice idea to think about trees. Um, I just Does the board have any thoughts on this particular matter? Well, are we going to be... I, I'm we're not discussing. Sure if, we don't yeah. have any answers. Yeah, no, no, so no. But I this is just a question, a question. Okay. Yes. But... The question was, did that resident, was that, was there a uh, responder, I believe, or? Responder, yes. Okay. Yes, it was. Because it's either, is it only open to people who responded, or is it op also open to everybody who was down there that was working or just happened to be down there? I mean, that's a distinction I think we also need to make. Do you is have it an be opinion? Anyway? I mean, again, instead of asking a yeah. question, I think offering an opinion would be helpful at this time like if you have an opinion about that what you think it should be i have to think about that well okay. the world trade center victim compensation fund has a parameter where you have to be down there and get um be, be exposed to actual ash so that's their parameter that okay so that's a good parameter. Mm -hmm. that parameter okay that's interesting so now, even with that you, you are we talking putting name plaque names out mm -hmm. okay but wouldn't that the families uh, would have to come forward. For the, for the Austin area, is that? Yes, for the Austin area. Yeah. Uh, town, we'll just well, be greater town not, of Austin. How, do you have any idea how many? No, none, none whatsoever. Because it seemed like we asked this before. I, I just don't remember. But it seemed as though we tried to find out before for some reason or another. And I don't remember what it was. I mean, we know people who perish there, I think. There was a short, a short-ish list. Yeah, I don't, I don't think eleven or twelve. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was even fewer. I thought it was three. I don't know why. I think maybe the town. Uh, I thought it was three. No, I thought it was three combined. Well, but, but I, I do know we have a lot of first responders that were, you know, have health issues because of it. So, sadly, I expect the list will grow. So. Right. So, so this World Trade Center Victim Compensation Fund. I guess, Jackie, if what you're suggesting is that that would be the measurement or the how you would substantiate right. who would be on eligible, eligible to be uh, on plaque should they 
you know, that's one parameter we could use because that's one that they're already using. So. Right. There's one that's in existence. So, yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, it certainly sounds good. I don't know if there's any way that we can find out. I mean, you know, I, I will say that the, the, the community um, resident who approached us about his father um, did say, you know, he would be willing to raise funds also. And I know a lot of times, in other words, I, I know that, for example, the plaques on the park benches, that's something that Rotary the person the ha is, is, has undertaken for the most part. I think they're almost all Rotary plaques, the ones on the benches. Um, so I don't know if that's, again, if that's something that we would want to do or if we would just say that, that the town would absorb the cost to add an additional name to an already existing plaque. Or we might give the family the option to buy the tag that goes on to the existing black. Right. We could do that, too. Or I don't know if it's a tag, though. I think they or actually have the, to come and physically um, add the engraving. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I was talking about. You know, sometimes if they have one, like a little thing that attaches to it, I guess another way that would be to inscribe it. Right. That's the perpetual whatever, right? They call it like what we have upstairs for our employee of the season. They have little tabs that they engrave and put on so they don't. Um, I just wanted to um, just wanted to mention that we also, when we were down there, had discussed having something like bricks. Um, I know like a lot of times for, you know, graduations and that kind of thing, they have, you know, engraved bricks that they, so, I mean, at that point you could make a circle of them and then a second layer if you needed to, or you could embed them in the ground. Um, wasn't the thing that we talked about to make like a walkway. So, so the only thing is, like, whatever you do, I think, like, when you do those little plaque, you know, the, the like, what you have upstairs, like, you know, like, you're giving an award every year. So you know you're, you kind of know what's coming. And since you have really no way of knowing if this is the one, you know, we're going to have one person or, you know, more, right. then whatever you do should be, I think you should be, like, be right. able to stand alone. So, I see. You know, because if, if you um, do something, you don't want to have something that's going to be perpetually blank either. Right. I see and the so. longer that you go, you know, the, the farther and farther away that it goes from 9-11, the, the likelihood that you're going to have a death that's related to that, you know, starts to dwindle just because of the mm -hmm. time. So, um, you know, something that could, you know, even that's unique, like a, like whether it's a planting or... An element in a garden so that way it's never going to look like there should have been more that's I mean that's also that's an interesting idea um, I I you know you just, does the garden evolve does it all have to be in the same place then because you know if you have plantings suddenly like start expanding your well it doesn't have I'm just I'm just, right. it doesn't have to be a planting but I'm saying is if you did um, that's why the bricks are kind of interesting the, because the you brick, could, yeah. it's a brick that stand a alone and then and you could always right. and then you could always use other bricks exactly that so something like that where but the the plaque thing it just like it could look empty you're saying well it's going to be weird if 20 years from now it's just that all the blank things you know right i mean alternately if you did something similar to what you're suggesting councilman Feldman, which is if you had an attachment so you have you know some piece and then you have like one in the center you add one above and one below to do like that so it kind of looks it could always look like yeah it was i'm just saying just just you know what i mean you don't know what you're gonna have or how many people and hopefully hopefully it won't be a lot right. so something that's just going to be you know maybe what we should do is reach out to uh our local trophy shop to see if they have had this experience anyplace else for this particular issue because i'm guessing we're not the only ones who have grappled with this um and just to see if they have a suggestion of how we could do it tastefully basically and allow it to be something where the families could make the contribution or you know they could raise money for the little additional plaque and we provide the space essentially for it okay maybe we can look at um what other communities have done also i'm sure if you do a search for 9-11 memorials, we can find a whole bunch of different different styles and mm -hmm. types. I know um, some of them have, you know, the names of bricks around it. Right. Like the gathering down in uh, Tensico. Right. Has all the names coming up into a sculpture. I mean, there's a lot of different ways it can be approached. I think we just want to do it some way that it is easy yeah. to expand it. Doesn't look 
silly if it's one or two names and um, isn't going to be tremendously costly or difficult to do uh, and is respectful, right? I think that's, and you know, makes everything look nicer and, and kind of fits in with the, with the um, environment down there. And how, how are we going to find out who's who? I, I, I think people are going to come to us and find us. I think, you know, what we could do is we could put some, you know, some letter in the Gazette or something like that at some point or put out, you know, a couple of blasts between the village and the town and, and you know, the two villages in the town. I mentioned it at the 9-11 memorial service, which is when most people would probably be there commemorating whatever right. their loved one's contribution was. I think that would, the first thing we should do is find out how many, you know, if we can. And, and and the legitimacy of the names, because uh -huh. I don't care what you do, there's somebody somebody that wants to be on there. Yeah, do something else, you know. So. Okay, and um, okay. Any other thoughts or suggestions? I actually about think if we ask at the firehouses, um, uh -huh. if they have an idea of how many of their members have, you know know somebody or were actually down there um sadly i think we'll get names that way okay so what i've heard what just to go back what i've heard is that um generally it seems like the board is in agreement that we should explore something that could be workable for um uh victims who were you know the world trade center um attack so as the <clears throat> I was just curious what the thought was in terms of residency. Um, would, and I mean, it may just have to be a fluid thing that, you know, as it comes up, you kind of have to look at each situation individually. I mean, um, my gut would be that it was somebody who was at living the time here at the time. At the time. At the time. It would be somebody who was living here at the time. And then, um, so we're going to look at what some other communities have done um we're going to reach out to our local trophy shop that does these sorts of things to find out a little bit more about what suggestions they might have for something or you might also reach out to the monument place and see if they have ideas also okay um and we are going to try to get some sense possibly through our firehouses about how many people we might be talking about um now and in the not too distant future um, see what other towns may have done and so just take a look at you know what we can find just searching the internet and then come back with a couple of suggestions for the board does that sound good I also just want to correct for the record I reached out to one of our first responders to see about that number and whoever said three was correct it was two uh, residents of Austin and one from Briarcliff that was you I haven't gotten to a number of the um, memorial services um, okay, so well, one question I did have. So, how about those three? Would they be on this plaque as well, or whatever we do? Plaque. I think that they probably would be. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I think we would add, need to add their names since I, again I think we, we should, thought yes. that their names yeah, were absolutely. someplace. I, we are not sure where. I know I've seen their names someplace, so I don't know where, but there's someplace in our community. I feel like they could be on the Arthur Jones Park. As he was that's, what, that's, that's what I was thinking about Arthur Jones Park. The little. The park in, that was built by the funds from the 9-11 fund for Arthur okay. Jones, who was killed in 9-11. Yes, that, that's right, Arthur Jones Park. Okay, that is, I think, where it was. Um, okay. Did you have something else, Council Member? Madame? I was just going to see if that was something where you would want to just reach out to the family first and make sure that they would be okay with that. I imagine they would, but it was just, you know. Sure. Okay, so thank you very much for that. Next up, uh, we ha wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about our um, dog park and dog run rules and regulations. Recently, we have received some complaints from community members who use our dog run area at Ryder Park. As well, we learned that people have no longer been purchasing permits to use the dog park up at Cedar Lane. We wanted to discuss some options for establishing regulations and a better mechanism for these permit sales so that we could ensure 
safety and enjoyment of these spaces for all. Council Don, can you give us some direction for our conversation? So the board, the town already has a chapter in its code governing dogs and another one governing parks. And it seems that at different points in time, there may have been some overlap that applied to what happens to dogs in parks. There was a provision that I believe was um, repealed in 2006. Um, so currently there's nothing in terms of local legislation that governs what happens. And um, as part of the town board's police powers for the protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public, um, these do have the authority to regulate. Um, so it's really just a matter of, I mean, there's some things to think about that we, we've seen with a lot of the local legislation in terms of leaf blowers and enforcement and that type of thing. Um, and then just based upon your firsthand experiences and what you've been hearing from the public, what you think could potentially be beneficial ways in which to restrict um, or regulate what's going on in the parks in order to, you know, kind of make sure that it's a comfortable and safe environment for both the, the public in terms of people as well as dogs. So, um, you know, it may be something that's going to be a process, but it seems like it's been an ongoing conversation. And so um, it seems like, as with any legislation, the first place to start, and I know you have had a conversation about this a while back, um, but if legislation is the direction that you want to consider going in, then, um, you know, it would probably need to start with a dialogue amongst yourselves about what your thoughts are about how to best do that for the town and whether, you know, whether the dog park and the dog run are treated differently, um, whether you link a park registration to the dog, getting the dog licenses, where how, how best to administer it from a practical perspective, as well as from a safety perspective and stuff like that. So, um, okay. Go. Thank you. <laughs> so some of the, um, some of the issues that have come up are dog walkers who would enter either a dog run, the dog run or the dog park with, you I'll know, typically. let's say five to 10 dogs on, on leashes, off leashes, whatever. Dogs could be big. I mean, so there's all different size dogs. A lot of people with smaller dogs, their little dogs are intimidated by bigger dogs, especially big and more intimidating dogs. Um, and then, you know, there's organizations nearby like the SPCA that I think some of their, their um, people who work there take the dogs over. So that's not necessarily somebody who lives in Austin, although somebody who has a business in Austin that caters to animals, uh, dogs in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. They actually emailed us about when is the dog run going to be open again? Ah. Because we, closed, we closed the dog run because we had an incident there where we had um, a dog walker with, I don't know, 10 dogs that walked in and, and has been doing this on a regular basis. And some people who wanted to go on with their one or two dogs, that were small and didn't feel like that they could they could do that. So um, you know we started sort of talking to people and finding out, and we found out a lot of information, which is that number one, even our dog park people haven't been paying uh, for their permits. That that sort of stopped. And number two, um, not everybody felt great about using the dog run. We also found out a little bit more about the history of the dog run and the dog park. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman Feldman because she is more of an expert than I, um, unless you have any questions, which I might have the answer to. Um, oh, so you want, want me to start about, with the history? Yeah. You want to talk a little tiny bit about the history just to update. And then also Councilwoman Shaw might want to weigh in a little bit about the history of the, um, the uh, rec advisory board on this. And we can talk about from there, what we think might be the best course of action so that we can ensure safety and okay. happiness. So the dog park started with a group of residents who had asked to use the area that had been the pool at the 52 Association, which had turned into the Cedar Lane Park. They had filled in the pool area. The pool had gone defunct, um, so there was still a fenced-in area. So there was a group of residents who wanted to form a dog park, approached the town, um, and they ran it as a group. It was another community group similar to the boat club, similar to 
a lot of other things in Ossining where it was the community members who raised the funds and bought the items and I what's it like uh doggy exercise equipment and ramps that one had ramps that one had i believe i don't know if it had wood chips i think that was a little money um anyway that got too small pretty quickly so they had another fundraising drive and they approached the town and asked if they could use the parcel at the top um i believe dave's fences was called and they donated a lot and the group came together and they were they collected funds and they put built that whole beautiful area, covered it in wood chips, brought picnic tables and things like that. Um, a little lean to to stand under when it rained, a board for information. And they had a real good community group that would clean up. There was no park employees doing anything. It was maintained completely by the members. They had a board. Um, they used to have picnics and fundraisers. They quickly learned that dogs like food and will fight over it, so picnics ended. Um, so they figured that out for themselves. It was sad because it was fun. Um, but they held little fundraisers like the pet parade at Halloween and everybody coming in costume. And they were all fundraising efforts that went to maintain the dog park. Moving along, um, some of the active members, their dogs had passed on. Sadly, dogs don't live forever. Um, and some of the new members came in and it actually became the top dog park in Westchester County. Actually, one of the top ten in the United States, I think. We, there was a magazine article. Very impressive. Um, so dog walkers found it. And then people were coming from out of town, and they were bringing, you know, five and six dogs. And they weren't watching the dogs. They were, you know, over here on their phone, and, and their dogs are running wild. And it had been started by people who were really responsible, watching their own dogs and their interactions and any attentions. So once the dog walkers started coming, it started to pose a problem. So they started talking about different memberships and everything. Then, I believe, uh, uh, okay, I can't tell you. You want to start with where the rec stepped in? Or? I'm not exactly sure when the rec stepped in as far as when that group started. But the, the group policed themselves. So uh, the rec, we, right. on the board anyway, we rarely heard, we only heard if there was an incident that, you know, someone got bitten or something like that. Um, so someone? part of Someone or Someone. another dog. It, okay. Both have happened. Anyway, yes. <laughs> um, but uh, so, it, but the the problems did start happening when you had people when we did get into that magazine and people started coming from out of town. So the people that were here, residents who were here and part of the group, were having trouble getting into the park when they wanted to get into the park because there were too many dogs, or their dogs weren't well trained for this, or the dogs were vicious. So that's when it started happening and. I'm not really sure what happened we set with up some, the members. Well, we set up the, the, the before, well, that, when it started happening, they set up guidelines. Dogs had to be neutered. Right. Um, they noticed that it was the unneutered dogs or the dogs in the presence of unneutered dogs that would start becoming aggressive. So they, you couldn't, you had and to have your dog neutered. police that? And the members would the police members themselves. members doing all uh -huh. of that at this point. Right. The members would police themselves. The members had work uh, cleanup days, just like we have clean up the park days. There was a continuous wheelbarrow, um, rake, and shovel. And usually people would, everybody who went there would just do a couple barrels full of just putting wood chips in any of the holes and filling it in. Um, there was a fire pit, which was gotten rid of by the town because, yeah, that's our, probably not a good choice in the middle of the woods, even though it was wonderful. With no wood chips. Um, <laughs> okay it was anyway it was a big fire pit okay. it was safe anyway dug down yeah um all right so that's gone so and the members were together to maintain the fences and the grounds so, and everything else right. so with the new people coming in and the old people transitioning out less and less people were doing the work um my ex-husband was one of the people he went a couple times a week and emptied those bags of dog deliveries oh. um and replaced the bags and took care of the dumpster and cleaned up um jeff miller was very active in have you paid your dues have you paid your dues then eventually the rec came along and i think they decided that it should be more for residents because it was the out of town people or at least they should have a you know the Resident, dog park people agreed that you know we should have a list of who's here right and we should know that everything's okay. So the dogs have their shots and all that kind right. of Right. Well, yeah, the rec 
wanted the dogs to have their shots and everything else, and more that it was more residents and not people coming in that could just drive away if their dog bit somebody. We want a little bit more accountability. Right. Um, but when the rec decided to start doing this, they collected a fee. People didn't want to pay a rec fee and a group fee. Right. So once there was nobody paying the group fees, that group kind of fell apart because they had no funds to do any of the things that they had been doing because the people didn't want to pay twice. I see. So it was a little gray area of who's, you know, they stopped donating to that. So now you have... But can I just back up board. for a second? So yeah. when they were policing themselves before it got out of control, but mm-hmm. I know that there were people who, you know, are who were involved members of that and people who got it started. I was there. Somebody walked in and, you know. People who got it started um, who then said, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Was that point at which they said, I don't want to deal with this anymore, even before the rec fees? Like, in other words, was it when these new uh, out-of-towners came in? There were two of those. Okay, so there was the group that was very involved and then they kind of disbanded for a while and then maybe a year or two, another group (laughs) formed and there was another board so there was a period of the original board and then there was a new board that formed and then that board in a few years also disbanded okay so there was so in in the absence so right now there's no board right there's no board. so so i think like to to fast forward like in the absence of a board what you know well so so the issue is now the recreation department is collecting fees for permits so you're supposed to be permitted to go in there but nobody's paying for permits so people are just using it and there's nothing to stop people from doing that because again there's no we're not sending a police you know a member of a police force out there to sit there and and patrol who's going in and who's not there's nobody standing at the door so unless we put some kind of a mechanism there to make it impossible for a person to get in to the dog park it's, you know, anybody can get in. Um, we did look into the possibility of doing some kind of an electronic fob system for a gate, but it would be rather expensive. Um, the alternative is that we could put a combination lock on the gate, and when somebody pays for a permit, they could get, um, they could learn what the combination is. Now, obviously, anybody could share the combination, but if you're a paying member, you may not choose to do so with somebody who isn't. That's so true. that is a possibility that has been floated by our parks foreman. Um, and I don't think it's such a bad um, p- possibility. What if you did long. that with, I, I don't think it yeah. would be a good use of, of time to have somebody sitting there. But what if you just did random. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So, like, by so I do and... think it would be like, if you're, if you're not going to force it, then no matter what you do, then people are going to become complicit or then. You know, are you going to have to change the um, combination every year because, you, you know, I mean, but, you know, but people sign up at different points. So not everybody's right. on the same cycle. So then that I see so, that as somewhat. So one of the things that we did talk about, which was, um, is there a regular point at which you get a, a dog license every year? Or is it also rolling? That's no, rolling. it's rolling. One of the things that we had talked about was um, having uh, the permit fee accompanying your dog license so you get your dog license and you pay $25 what do we pay for a dog license to okay we don't remember if it's paid or, 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 or okay. 15 and or then whatever. you would pay an additional amount and if you're a resident you know you, you have to have, have a license for your 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 animal you have to save for spayed or neutered and then at the same time we would assess everybody basically who's getting a license with another fee at which point you would get your permit and Okay, but right. although realistically, yeah, the, it would only you could only do that to the neutered ones because the unneutered ones are not allowed in the park. That's true. Okay, right. So, so we just so give it to the neutered ones. I think That's though, fine. I think that you have to have a combination like like public education, like like well, there they, has to be they, something yeah. out there that says you know the park isn't here for free. Like you have to right. you know, and then like have something posted where the consequences of getting caught here without a permit. Or with an unneutered dog, or with ten dogs, or whatever the rules are, is a really, right. really stiff penalty, like super stiff. Which like, is super stiff to you? I don't know. Like I, I dollars at least. Okay. At least two hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars to uh, for a fee for a, a fine if you are caught with your dog in the park without. Because I think the, the implication is that 
you're not going to be able to sit there all the time. But if people know that there's a risk that, you know, they're going to, and, and you go up periodically, I don't know what's reasonable. You'd have to talk to the police well, department. Yeah, but so there, there are, there is conversations starting because of our conversations starting um, about people who are interested in stepping up and they didn't realize how that's how it used to run and these are newer people and they are interested in stepping up and forming a board. I'm hearing whisperings. Haven't, I which is that. fine, which but is I think great. That we still are, we're but no, absolutely, no, 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 no. Issue, I absolutely that the board agree gets that. tired, their dogs. But some of the things that away. they've been saying is if, um, obviously, they would a like if somebody, you know, if it wasn't to do through the license, they were wondering if they could have a couple of sign up days where somebody from the town would come, like on a weekend day, you know, or in an evening, you know, once in a while, like you know, May sign up day and April sign up day. This is the day you can sign up and have, you know, and somebody could sit there and register them because that was one of the difficulties is getting here during the town office areas. And they would happily pay and they want to be a member, but they really can't get during the, the, the records. That was one thing that was mentioned. Another thing was, could it be online? Mm -hmm. That was another thing that was mentioned. And they said, if somebody could come up here and actually check, it didn't have to be often, but, you know, pop up anytime on a weekend or pop up in on an evening and when there's a bunch of people here and say who here is registered um it would make the people who are registered feel better because they're like why did i register nobody else is registered so at least they'd be able to say yes i'm registered and you know and then there would be an a penalty for the people you who know but i think that like having some posting it's about the implications like the risk if your dog's not registered if you're not following the rule the fact yeah that, no absolutely like, just like a peer pressure campaign mm -hmm. because you know I think that that's what part of it. Work. Well, I think that part of it is like to your point, like people may not know, or somebody shows up, and because there's no rules, like right. or the so, rules are not. Right, let's yeah. just talk about. Well, what, the rules are hard to, for whatever reason, not being communicated effectively. So let's just talk about the rules a little bit, though, because I think that that's part of like what we would have to do is implement a local law, right? right. That would then give us some teeth to the, to be able to impose fines if you didn't follow it, right? So that's, I think that's what that um, Christy was suggesting that we need to do. So I guess the question is, one of the things that can have had come up is, do we limit how many dogs somebody can, can yes. bring in? Yes, yes. Do we limit, we already have that they can't bring it's a dog that is in spade or neutered, so that's fine. Do we limit um, it to only residents, or can it be for non-residents, but they pay uh, a higher fee for yes. their permit? Yes, and they're happy to do that. Okay. So that's fine. Um, how do they, they, when they go to get to pay for the permit, they need um, a rabies vaccination right. now, certificate. They, right. They need to show the rabies and they need to show spayed or neutered and light and that they have a dog license, right? Because those are all requirements. That's what they need for their license. Also. For their from To their get a license, license you need to show the rabies vaccination. Right. But if we aren't giving them the license because they come from Newcastle, then they would need to show that they had a dog license. Right. Right. And then that makes sure that 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 the requirements are the same um so we know that they have to have a license we know that they have to be spayed or neutered we know that um they would pay more um do we think that it's good to assess for everybody like so that we could tie it to the license and we could move the permitting to the clerk's office that's another thing we had discussed because um the system that currently allows us to do dog licenses does also allow us to add to it so we could theoretically add a permit. I think that's think a online. great idea because A, they're being, the fees are being collected by the village and the dog park and the town see none of that. So I think that's a little confusing to me on many levels. Um, so I think that being able to collect the money and set it aside for something used for the dog park mm -hmm. would be beneficial and that would be you know, reasonable to do. And um, was I was just going to say, online. based on your suggestion, actually, about the, the online is something that right. actually started this conversation. Um, right now, if you were um, doing your dog license online, that's only for um, locals, right? That's only for people right. who are in Austin yeah. to get the dog license. And what we had suggested was changing, actually, by in the fee schedule, the amount of the dog license, and that would be all inclusive. So you're licensing your dog for a year, and built into that is your $10 a year, whatever it is that you pay to be a member of the dog park. So when you come to get your license, that's the only way that we could do that part online as it stands right now, is if it's coupled with the okay, license so itself. Okay, so we don't have a separate way to make I thought, okay. oh, I thought at, at this time, there is not. So that we could actually add something. If we attach it to the dog license. Right, right. 
Now, the only question, though, is, is we separate uh, the one thousand because if somebody's not, uh, if someone's from out of town, they would not be able to no, pay no, online. No. Okay, well, that's okay. If they're if they're from out of town, they can't pay online. Okay, or but the other thing is, if the dog is getting a license but isn't spayed or neutered, they can't. They, there's no reason to assess them a fee because they can't use the dog park. We go back to the argument of you pay the same taxes for paving in Austin, whether you drive on every single street or you don't. I mean, if it's a, a fairly nominal fee, um, you know, that's that's if it's for ease of administration, I think yeah, that could be justified. Okay, yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, right. There are people who, I mean, I know it's not a good plan, don't get their dog license for whatever reason. Um, so then they would just not be able to use the dog park. I guess you could come and or, pay in person. And you can come and pay in person. Or if you don't and show your certificates. And... If you don't have a dog license. But then you then you're not allowed in the dog park. Yeah, you're not allowed in the dog park. That's right. So everyone's been saying you can't use the dog park unless the dog's spayed or neutered. Um, where is that coming from? It's written on the outside of the dog park in the rules. Okay. <laughs> those rules have I mean, been those, those rules adopted rules. by the Rec Advisory Board. Right. Okay. okay, and those rules were always in place. I mean, they're they're a whole so bunch. That, you can't have more than three dogs. You can't have more than three dogs. You can't. They, and we they do have, to have these signs. Neutered. And one of the reasons that the signs came down at the at the dog run was because they hadn't been codified, which makes me confused because for whatever reason the park superintendent didn't ask for the dog park signs to be taken down, only the dog run signs to be taken down. Which, if none of this was codified in town law, I don't know why that would have been. Well, part really of the sense. problem was the dog run, as it's called, was never really a dog park. It was a wiffle ball field, right. and then people started using it, and it's kind of take, took on a life of its own, but it's not really supposed to even be there. I guess, but what I'm saying is that, first of all, I think it was a suggestion that did come from our park's foreman, because he said people were walking their dogs on yes. the ball fields. Yeah. So to get the dogs off the ball fields and give them a spot to be... Right. It made more sense to use the wiffle ball field that wasn't being used for right. a wiffle ball. That's how it's so going. I don't think it's a bad idea. I don't have any problem with it. Um, I just think that we need to make it also part of this dog yeah. park system, the, the, right? The, the rules, the same rules should apply. Right. Yeah. It seems like the same rules should Absolutely. apply. When we talk about the dog park, are we going to allow the members to have work party days where they can spruce up the park? I don't see why not, but I guess we'd have to look into what the laws are for liability. That, but right. I know that, that they always and, did. And then I think really one guy, I don't know, hit himself in the head with the shovel. Right. And, you know, we do have a form in the day. Teamsters contract that allows for volunteer days in our parks. Um, so I'm sure, you know, if they were able to provide liability insurance, I'm sure that we could use that um, so long as it wasn't, you know, an ongoing thing. If it were a couple times a year, I think they would probably be amenable right. to that. Didn't we do right. that for the Little League? Did, yes. Wouldn't the, yep. the baseball, they would yes. come in and yep. they would make mm -hmm. improvements. But, we, but they, we did require certain levels of insurance in that, those instances as well. Right. So, but if they're paying through the rec, if they're paying through their dog licenses fees, then would we take those fees and cover, get the insurance for the liability? Or are they going to be expected to collect on their own as well? Which is where they were getting into the sticky part as a board. They're already being right. so they're the already paying over here, be and do they also yeah. have to they're pay over here? Not an organization like a five hundred one c three similar to what those other organizations. I think are. what I mean, and we could certainly check with our insurance agent. But what we might suggest is similar to what we've been talking about lately with some other activities, having them sign a, a participant waiver that basically says, right. you know, right. I, I'm signing off on my rights. I understand I'll be here to clean the dog park on this date, this time, whatever. Um, and I understand that if I'm injured, you know, I'm I'm holding the town harmless and you know. Yeah, I think that's a great, that's okay. a great suggestion. Okay. You have to go to the microphone. I just want to know how I, how I give my concerns. Um, so that would be um, something that we are at the point, the next thing that we're going to do, and you can certainly just send an email. That's the best thing. Okay. So we're going to, if we're going to uh, look to adopt a law, we're going to have to have a public hearing. And at the public hearing process, that's when the public has, has a chance and opportunity to weigh in. But if you have any suggestions or thoughts, you know, we would welcome you to send an email to, to the town board, which is TC, town council, at townofostany.com. And then we all get it. Um, and that's really the easiest. Okay. okay? But thanks for coming. So do you have some direction or idea to start to 
think about drafting. Well, I mean, well, we haven't really talked about anything very. I mean, we talked about number of dogs. Residents get a higher fee. You can't pay online. You have to no. have a license. Oh no, yeah. not that you can't pay online, but you, if you're a non-resident, you can't pay online. We would we would shift the collection of the, we would shift the permitting process to attach it to the license right through the clerk's office through the clerk's office. We talked about and what's I your think, number of dogs? Uh, hmm? X move three. Three? I thought it was two someplace. There was something that someone found in the town code that said you can only own a certain amount of dogs. Well, it's based upon acreage, so um, there's a set number. I think it... I don't have the zoning code in front of me. I could probably bring it up. Um, but it was there was a flat number, and then if your property exceeded a certain amount, you could you could own more. So, so it's not um, that you couldn't get a permit. It's just that you can't have, you can't, you can't have bring them more all to than the park. three dogs at a time in the dog park. Per person. Dog run per person. But that oh, yeah. Was, right? yeah. That was something yeah. that had come up during the initial discussion. I think Victoria had raised it. Um, is three a lot or is two, is three two is, more reasonable? I mean, three even seems like a lot for if somebody walks in. I have a question though. Is when you go, just because I don't have a dog and I haven't done this, if you go to the rec and you get a, a you pay to, be a member of the dog park. Are you paying per dog or are you paying per household? Because at, at that point, license I think per it's dog. now per dog, right? License is per it? dog. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you have to get every dog licensed, right? You're not getting a but I'm just saying, how, dog, I, I don't know how it works. You know, right it, now, does it work per, it's it's Liz and however many dogs Liz brings in, whether they're my dogs or Northern's dogs or Dana's dogs, it doesn't matter because Liz is a member of the dog park. I don't know how it works. I think it would it need used, to be when per When I last animal. registered Zach, it was just family and whatever dogs I had, but I believe they changed it after we stopped going. There's a member of the board that you could be, that's the person, but it's the dog that's licensed. So you could bring your licensed dog, your dog walker could bring your licensed dog to the dog park, and your dog walker wouldn't necessarily have to be an Austin resident. So the dog, dog is a dog member, not the, so the dog, dog is, is a member. member. Okay. The dog's a member. And actually, that's another thing that the, um, the dog park people brought up they would like a different color tag every year so that they could identify people that hadn't paid and they can say hey you know you, you haven't gone to get your new tag yet yeah, but the thing is that like you're not getting it at the same time every year but it would all be green for no it's like not your, gonna, like no, your inspection it's not sticker gonna, it's not yeah but the inspection sticker has got a color but it's got a date because not every car gets inspected at the same time so like, unless you have everybody, like, anything like that's going to be problematic because it's rolling. I mean, I guess you could shift. Maybe what we could do is shift to an annual license and permit. But, but what if I get my dog in the middle of the year? You, like, get your, you get your license until the end of the year. I don't know. I think that gets more complicated. What if I get, like, what if I get a dog in December? Then I got to apply and then apply again in January? A lot of people get don't dogs Don't bring them to the dog park until January. Don't bring them. Well, but if you're going to tie it to the license, then, you know, I, I think that you're making this too complicated. Like, I, I really do. Like, I think that. Well, this is just one of the things that the people at the dog park had brought up, that they would like to be able to see that somebody hadn't renewed their tag. And that was. Everyone without, yeah, I mean, we do that with the, with the boat launch trailer so that we can see that the tag is a different color and we can tell them that they need yeah, to get a new one. Yeah, but that's seasonal. Right, like you do it every well, season. It's a year long. They they fish whenever. I mean, they don't fish but, in the but ice. But it's but the but the renewal is seasonal. The renewal is whenever they first go. Yeah. I don't think you could prorate it or something like that. Um, or I mean, anybody who gets it. I don't know. Um, I feel like it could be inspection sticker type. You know, like okay, you have until, and then it wouldn't be till the next January that you could start shaming them, but. Yeah, you know, or you go, did you? Yeah, I got it in December. Oh, okay. I don't know. But don't then, know. It, then it makes that was it, just a, a, but that makes it hard to enforce then because you're making it more arbitrary. So, you know, it, it would also make it better if one of our parks employees goes up there and he could take a quick, quick scan around and see every dog, dog had a little green tab on it and he wouldn't have to have a conversation and, or purple tab or whatever. I mean, I guess what you could do is you could have t you could have colored ta tabs tags for the permit and you the only thing i don't exactly understand is how you get a physical tag does it get mailed to you because then that you're imposing another expense if you're ordering it online how do you get it well do you get mail your license 
I do not know the answer to that question. I don't know the answer Something to that question. Something to find out. So, but just say, if, if we had color tags and you had two years worth of color tags, so you have like 2019, 2020, somebody comes in in December, you give them their 2019 tag and then you give them their 2020 tag. Um, I don't know how you... I, guess I was thinking again. about that too, but then like, what if someone comes, like, where's the line right, for exactly. that one? It's just, it's slippery. Yeah. I think it's just hard. Okay. To well, that. okay. So let's just say that but, we would like to work out the details so, of this because so, we don't have to figure that out a lot. The other thing too is like, I don't think you're going to make this so foolproof that every, like you right. are going to get somebody like, like any other law oh, yeah. where, so I think if you put again, the combination of sort of peer pressure but also like periodic, like I and I don't right. have any idea what would be reasonable. But going in Rates. and knowing Rates. that Rates it's like dog park. like it's a two hundred <laughs> yeah like exactly like it's a two hundred and fifty dollar fee right. if you're expired, and then maybe you have to have a card with you because that would work if you have a card with you, mm -hmm. then the card will have all the information. You don't need to have it on a dog tag. It's not really an extra expense because it's a more nominal expense. Mm -hmm. But the card's going to say whether it's valid for that year or not, and you have to produce that. Like, you need the card. The same way you need you need the card when you go to the rec center, why can't you, you know, why do why can't you bring the card when you go to the dog park? I guess if you have a dog walker, but anyway. Even well, so, you could give the yes, dog walker the card. Give your dog walker I mean, the card. I, yes, you know, absolutely. But, but you need the card. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to produce that, and that you may be asked to produce that when you're in the dog park. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's a bad idea. It's pretty good. I mean, it's hard to look at and see quickly, like you said. But I know. I mean, just having a little tag on their collar, like you know, next to the rabies tag. Okay, Seems easy, but work that, either way, we'll work on that later. Well, I don't oh, know but it's necessarily that well, easy, depending on how hairy the dog is or any. You know, I mean. No, that's fair. No. <laughs> okay. And is your dog license? I guess yes. what I'm saying is, let's let's get out of the weeds here and just. What I think we really need to talk about is what is the substance of the law that we're talking about. That's really what we need to, we need to focus on. All dogs go to jail. I don't know. <laughs> so we, we talked about of the, all dogs go to heaven. The sign that's there to know what's on there and then work from there. Okay, so that's a good idea. We can work from the sign. Um, I think we actually requested. I might have even gotten. I think somebody actually did take a yes, picture, right? And I, we have a picture of at least one of the signs, if not both of the signs, uh, the dog park and the dog run. Um, so we can send, we can look at those, send that to Christy, and then we, and then we talked about a limit of three dogs or two dogs. Does anybody want to weigh in on this? No. <laughs> okay. The general rule is two, and then if you're on an, a parcel of more than two acres, uh, oh, on maximum of two animals over the age of six months on lots of a quarter acre. And then it gets progressively more um, with larger acres. So, I mean, with a special permit, you could get over four. So it really varies. Okay. Um, so, again, I'm asking the question to the one dog owner. Are you the only dog owner at the table? Uh, that's really sad. Um, so you're, you said three. I feel like up to three. If, okay. if you're controlling them. Okay, so up to three allowed in the dog park by one person who's who, with the dog at the same time. Not it's not household. It's up to three dogs in the dog park. At the yeah, same time. with yeah. You know, the dog with limits the on the dog license. Yeah, supervised by someone over the age of. Oh yeah. Her. Yes. So like, I can't send three dogs with my five-year-old's kid. Fourteen-year-old can't. Fourteen-year-old A can't drive up there. Oh, they could walk. No, um, so they they have to be liable. They have to be able to be responsible for the actions of. I don't know if that's something you can legislate. That they could be. They have to be eighteen years old. No, that that like the, their their, someone's liability based upon their age and what no, I happens. Think that, no, I think that I think that Councilman Coleman is just suggesting that they be eighteen, so that they then have, they have their uh, an adult. So they have oh, to like have, two dogs get in a fight. You didn't control your dog. Hey, I'm fourteen. What am I going to do? You yeah, I, ju I just don't know if it's that hard of a line at the age of 18. Okay. Um, 16? They're on that sign, I mean, they, they don't want children in the dog park, as a general rule, especially small children. All right, That's so one of the we can rules. say you need to be 18 years of age or, or older. I, I don't have, 
a problem. I mean, you could make it 16. Uh, 16. 16, yeah, okay, 16. You're driving, you want to take your dog to sure. the park? 16 years. Okay, so we've got 16. I don't know. We talked about number of people. We talked about a fine of $250 if you're caught with a dog in there that doesn't isn't permitted to be in there. Um, hmm? Or a dog that's not permitted to be in there. So if they show up with three dogs and... Oof. Well, yeah. Yeah. Your dog. Sure. And. Yeah. Sure. The same fine bringing more than three dogs. I think the fine should be for breaking any of the rules. Like you, you break a dog rule, you get fined. Okay. You know. Um, okay. And we're going to have to pass this by our um, law enforcement. Yeah. Course. That's a really high Police, fine. rec department. I get why it's a really high fine, but that's a really high fine. What do you think the fine should be? I don't know. And what's think, the, for which? But, but you, but yeah, you, you want them to take, you want them to take it seriously. Like, 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 if you don't do a high fine, then nobody's, you know, then that's why it's serious. And you're not going to be getting fined all the time because it's not like somebody's going to be, you know, like that's, you know, you're not getting checked. So but people are taking that risk because they know that there's not somebody constantly there. I think you have to up the fine to make it, to balance out the fact that you're not, always there okay i'd love to hear the public feedback on that one but yeah i mean okay no i, I see your point i absolutely see that i don't plan on following like, the rules you know, the, no this isn't like there, there's no. a there's a public health risk there's a risk to your dog there's like it's serious consequence if you break the rules like you, right. you and that you, would definitely dissuade the dog walkers more Right, because but, they're but, just because they're the ones that are going right, to come. They'll and lose all their start. profits if they get you know, and you could do the fine for their, you know. They might lose the business if they take it. The dog. But what? What? Um, but you know, again, you're doing this because, and and presumably, dog owners they are taking their dog to the dog park because they want to be responsible and they want their dog to get exercise and they're good owners and they you know. So if I was taking my dog to a dog park, I'd want to know that all the other dogs have their shots that no one's you know, uh, you know, there's. You know, everybody's neutered or spayed or whatever. You know, I'd want to know that if I. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. I... Okay. So, where are we on this? Are we have enough? Do we have enough to get started so that we can take a like we could review a draft of a local law um, at some point in the not too distant future or not? So, what are you looking at? Like your next work session, the two work sessions from now. What are you thinking? Um, I think our next work session. Yeah, mostly because it's busy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I can get it started. Um, you know, I, I think between our signs and some of the input from tonight, do you feel like you have like enough to put together some, something you guys may hate it and may need to okay. be changed, but I mean, I guess you, okay. you know, it's good to work from something. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, that that's what we did, you know, with the leaf blowers and right. you know, yeah. you, you start somewhere and then once you see it on paper, it's easier to right. decide <laughs> how you really feel about okay, it. Okay. Great. All right. So we have a place to start with this. Great. Um, next up, we have a uh, local waterfront revitalization plan grant and work plan development RFQ or request for qualifications discussion. So on May 1st, Governor Cuomo had announced this year's round of regional economic development council grants under the consolidated funding application or CFA program. Each year when these grants are announced, communities across the state start taking a look at the funding opportunities available and consider which pots of funding would be helpful for their communities. This year, the town is considering applying for funding to complete a local waterfront revitalization plan or LWRP from the New York State Department of State. We do not have one of these right now. The town currently doesn't have one and that it's a planning document that does exactly as it sounds. It addresses revitalization opportunities along waterways in the community. So it's not just the waterfront. The village of Austin has an LWRP, which addresses part of Lewis Angle Park, which is a town park in the village, but it doesn't extend north or south along the Hudson past the village boundary, nor does it include other smaller waterfronts along the Croton River or in the Pacantico River watershed. Also, the village of Austin does not have jurisdiction over Angle Park, so we plan to address the revitalization of this town parkland in our LWRP2. Once completed, the town can continue to seek funding year after year from the Department of State to implement the recommended projects in the initial LWRP. This grant application will certainly be a strategic one for the town as it will expand our opportunities for grant eligibility in the years to come. 
LWRP is a bit of a complex program, so it is time for us to call in the experts. I'm hoping that the town board will authorize the supervisor's office to issue a request for qualifications for a grant writer to assist in the development of our application and work plan for the development of our LWRP. Even though the deadline isn't until July, since grant announcements were just released, we need to get out ahead of the curve to ensure that we obtain the best possible uh, firm that is qualified um, or individual. And I want to give the board a chance to discuss this as we have a resolution on our special meeting tonight, which is related to going out for an RFQ for this purpose. Do we know how much these people typically cost? Um, there is um, <coughs> a range, and I would say that it is not inexpensive, um, but I think it's going to be well worth our investment um, because if we invest in a company that has been successful in the past in rating these grants and is very familiar with the program, um, and I have talked to a couple of them, um, they will know if it's even worth our applying for this and I believe it is because that's the direction that we've received um, and it could be between five and eight thousand dollars for the for this particular thing but then if we have an LWRP in place it could it could reap hundreds of thousands and we of dollars can keep using grants. it year after year after absolutely year. <laughs> it basically lays the foundation for us to get money for a whole and this is beyond of, our amazing Victoria but the, she's really awesome the, the other thing too it's it's that when you write a grant like this it's all consuming so it takes you away from your day-to-day -day and it tends to make your your other work suffer like it's not something that's even if you're a great grant writer it's all consuming during that time so there is like an like a cost, um, you know, like sort of an opportunity cost that like you lose. So if if you have a staff person who's writing this grant for a month and, and it really is a lot, a tremendous amount of work, then so many other things aren't getting done. So instead of looking at it that you're paying extra, like, you know, you're paying this big chunk of change, you look at it like, well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's much, much cheaper than hiring somebody and you know, if you win, the other thing that happens when you do it in house, when it's a, when it's a like a complicated grant like this, is that you tend to, you know, you really need somebody who writes it, and then you need a lot of eyes on a grant, and you need time to review it, and that when you do it in house, you're like getting it all together the last minute. It's going out the door. It's very very hard to manage it because it's hard for people who work all day to have the dedicated time to make sure that you build in the review time to it. So I think you do um, significantly increase your odds of being successful if you go with a reputable consultant who's had a good track record with the CFA grants. I, I think it's okay. and Danny, very, saying, very well worth it. And you, Danny, you were saying that it would encompass both our Croton waterfront, Carbucky area, uh, all the parts that are in the town? Crawbucky, yes, I guess so, because we have a small piece over there, yes. Right, well, that's Crawbucky Beach technically yes. is ours in the yeah. town. Mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Um, Anything that's along a water, waterway. So we're going to look at it all. Okay. We are, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's in the art. And even if you don't, you know, you don't get it, like you, you sort of you build your capacity, mm -hmm. you, you get more feedback, you have more, so, you know, it's an investment in ultimately, you know. Applying. Yeah, right. so it's it's, it's not one money the, it's not money wasted in any yeah, way. It's my impression is it's one of the things that the grant awards people look for in right. and we, with their consideration. We've process. been asked many times if we have an LWRP, and so we don't have that to refer to, and I think that that's hurt us in our grant applications in the past, which is why, um, and you know, we thought we we know that the village has like Angle Park written in, so we've been trying to get this um, plan to um, you know rethink. Angle Park, for example, and it's been hard because some of the funding opportunities that would be available to us if we had the LWRP aren't okay. um, available to us. So we think that again, I think that it's going to um, have the other the other side is going to have the the potential benefit of reaping hundreds of thousands of dollars over, you know, the next. So five the to village ten years. has one, but they don't they don't expand the whole waterfront. It's not all of it. Yeah. It so did they do the Sparta angle. area? Um, I don't think so, no. Could we do this far to area? I believe we could. Because I think that that's an opportunity to get yes. that historic ship. There's deep enough water there. So if we could get the 
-hmm. This is a pie pie in the sky dream. But if we can get Metro North and GM to give us back the bridges that they took away when they had those double decker railroad cars and get back over to that island there, um, we can conceivably have that historic ship dock and a whole little addition to our historic park like it used to be like a lot of years ago before they stopped letting us do that. Okay. And, you know, that would be a great re used we i mean that's it used to be used people used to swim there which probably isn't where the direction will go but there's a channel there of deeper water where it would be much easier for these bigger ships to mm -hmm. approach um including that one that that antique fire boat that is looking for a home not that we could do that anytime soon but you know ships like sure. it well you know a lot of restored ships would not want that okay. so anyway if we could look at that too fine great any other comments or discussion mm -hmm. Okay, so may I have a motion to go into our special meeting? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, now roll call. Councilwoman Tatori? Present. Councilwoman Shaw? Present. Councilwoman Feldman? Present. Councilman Wilcher? Present. And Supervisor Levenberg? I am. All right, so into our special meeting. Next up, um, we have oh, our speaking over announcements. Um, going into our board resolutions, and the first uh, one is... Um, a lease agreement for a senior nutrition program for Pacifica. Resolved that the town board of the town of Austin authorizes the supervisor to sign a lease schedule with Acme Auto Leasing LLC, North Haven, Connecticut, for the 12 month lease with $3,200 monthly payments with a $1 buyout at the end of the lease term for a 2019 Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid Touring, VIN number 2C4RC1H78KR67903, and be it further resolved that this lease schedule is subject to the terms of the Municipal Master Open End Vehicle Lease Agreement between the Town of Ossining and Acme Auto Leasing LLC, dated March 31st, 2017. Do I have a motion? So as you may remember, the town recently leased to purchase a Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid for our senior nutrition program to replace a vehicle that had to be put out of service. The seniors are loving this car and very much enjoying their trips around town in this plug-in hybrid minivan. We have another Pacifica on order, so hopefully in just a few weeks we will be accepting that lease agreement as well. And I think, as I might, might have mentioned in the past, the reason that we chose to do a lease instead of a purchase is because we have an opportunity to uh, realize savings through the federal uh, tax incentive program. And since we're not, uh, since we're a tax exempt organization, the only way we can do that is by leasing it through another company. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Ossining hereby terminates the appointment of Michael Santiago, Park Groundskeeper, effective May 4th, 2019. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Ossining hereby increases the hourly rate of Town Highway Department part-time intermediate clerk Fern Casada from $16.24 per hour to $20 per hour, effective May 1st, 2019. So moved. Second. Uh, so Fern joined the town staff in late 2017 and has since picked up a great deal of responsibility at the town highway department. With the departure of Francine at the end of April, uh, Fern's picking up even more work, and by all accounts, she's been doing a great job. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Whereas Governor Pataki signed the Workplace Violence Prevention Act into law on June 7, 2006, which requires all state and local governments in New York State to conduct a risk assessment of their work sites and to identify and address any existing risk factors that may increase the likelihood of workplace violence. And whereas the act also requires annual training for all employees and boards, as well as the annual readoption of the Injury and Illness Prevention Program for Workplace Violence, which was first adopted in 2007. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the town board of the town of Ossining hereby readopts this program for calendar year 2019 and hereby commits to working to maintain a safe and healthy environment for all town employees. Do I have a motion? So, second. so since New York State made this program a requirement for all municipalities back in 2007, the town has committed to ensuring that all Town of Austin employees are trained annually in the town's zero tolerance policy for workplace violence as well as warning signs and reporting requirements. Thanks so much to Maddie's Ahach in my office, as well as the Town Safety Committee, for ensuring that we are in compliance with this important program. Questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Assining hereby authorizes the retention of Risk Management Associated of Fort Montgomery, New York, for the purpose of performing mandatory health and safety training for the Town of Assining Parks, Highway, and Cemetery employees at a price not to exceed $4,800 for training conducted on June 5th, 2019 and June 19th, 2019. Second. Moved. So speaking of compliance, Lisa Hansen of Risk Management Associ Associates will be joining mm -hmm. us next month to make sure that all of our parks, highway, and cemetery workers get their annual mandated training that is exclusive to the work they do, such as hearing conservation, respiratory protection, and spill response, among others. Lisa does a great job of engaging our guys, and we're excited to have her back with us this June. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Resolved that the Town Board of the Town of Assining authorizes the Supervisor's Office to issue a request for qualifications for a project entitled Local Waterfront Revitalization Plan and Lewis Engel Waterfront Park Master Plan to complete grant development on an application to the New York State Department of State's Local Waterfront Revitalization Program and Preliminary Work Plan, and be it further resolved that proposals must be returned to the Supervisor's Office, 16 Croton Avenue, Assining, New York, by Friday, May 17, 2019. Moved. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? With that, may I have a motion to enter executive session for personnel and advice of council? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope to see you next Tuesday when we'll be back at the Birds Off Fagan Police Court facility at 7.30 p.m. for our regular meeting. Have a wonderful week.